Welcome to Nature Days. I'm Brienne, and today we're going to talk about invasive species. We'll go over what this means and why we should care about them, but first we need a little bit of background on ecosystems. An ecosystem is a community of living things interacting together and with the non-living parts of the environment. The number and variety of these living organisms is known as biodiversity. Each one of the living pieces of an ecosystem relies on other pieces to survive. Removing an organism could throw the ecosystem out of balance and result in the loss of other organisms. A well-known example of this involves sea otters. Sea otters off the west coast of the United States live in kelp forests eating sea urchins. A ton of other creatures live in the kelp forests, relying on that ecosystem for food and shelter. Sea otters were heavily hunted for their fur in the 18th and 19th centuries, almost being wiped out or going extinct. At this point, there were no longer enough predators keeping the numbers of sea urchins down, so their population exploded. Their main food source was the kelp itself, so the kelp forests were being wiped out, which really hurt all the other organisms that relied on that ecosystem for survival. Once the sea otters were protected, their numbers started coming back, and the number of sea urchins went down, and the kelp forests started coming back. Now, there is no invasive species involved in this situation, but it was an example to show how out of balance an ecosystem can get when you remove a piece or reduce the biodiversity. Not every organism will have this large of an impact on their ecosystem as the sea otters did, but it will make a difference for the organisms it interacts with. So what is an invasive species and what does it have to do with ecosystems and biodiversity? The plants and animals that have always been living in an area are known as native or indigenous species. Invasive species are non-native species that damage an ecosystem. It's important to note that not every non-native species is invasive. Some simply die out and others can become naturalized, fitting into the ecosystem without damaging it. Invasive species, though, can cause a lot of problems, often by spreading and out-competing native species. For example, some invasive plants grow early and quickly, leaving no room for native plants to grow. The invasive plants are often not fed on by native wildlife, allowing them to spread even more. This leads to fewer native plants, which often leads to fewer animals that rely on those native plants for food and shelter. That could lead to fewer animals that may eat the animals that rely on those plants. This is an all-around reduction in biodiversity. At some point, some species may no longer be able to survive at all. This is why we care about invasive species. But how do the invasive species show up in a new area in the first place? Well, it's often because of people. Sometimes it's an accident. The Great Lakes are now filled with an invasive zebra mussels released from a ship's ballast water. Rats have been introduced to many tropical islands by being present on the boats traveling between them and the areas the rats originally lived in. Other times, it's less of an accident. A number of invasive plants were first planted as an ornamental plant or as some kind of environmental control before they spread out of control. Burmese pythons are becoming a problem in the Everglades because of people buying them for pets and then releasing them once they get too big. They find a lot to eat and don't have much in the way of predators, so it's easy for them to increase in population and continue to eat the animals that aren't used to defending against them. So which invasive species are you likely to see around the area, and is there anything we can do about it? Let's take a look. First, we'll see a few of the invasive plants you can find pretty easily in the woods or along the roadside. Shrubs and bushes are usually pretty easy to spot. Multiflora rose is one of these. It was introduced to the United States in 1866 as rootstock for ornamental roses and was also planted as a living fence and for erosion control. It spreads easily through seeds, roots sprouting, and layering, which is where branches touch the ground and sprout new roots. The rose hips containing the seeds are eaten by birds and spread to new areas. They can stay in the soil for up to 20 years waiting for the proper sprouting conditions. It's pretty difficult to get rid of completely because of this. Young plants can be pulled, but older or larger ones will take a lot more work. The full root system needs to be removed to prevent them from returning. The usual method is to mow and then put herbicide treatments on the roots. Penn State Extension has more information on this and other invasive plants, as well as more detail on the best available removal method. 
Unfortunately, with many of these plants, it's very difficult to remove them completely, or else they wouldn't have become such a problem in the first place. Another commonly seen invasive shrub is the Japanese barberry. This is a worry not only because it crowds out native plants, but because black-legged ticks, which transmit Lyme disease, tend to increase in areas with dense barberry. Removal procedures are pretty similar to the multiflora rose. There are other types of plants beyond shrubs, though. Garlic mustard is an herb, believed to have been introduced for medical and food reasons. That's right, you can eat this one. Its leaves have a garlicky taste and you can toss it in salads or use it to make pesto. However, if you want to try this, it's important to always be 100% sure you know which plant you have if you're going to eat something you find in the woods. If you're 90% sure, don't eat it. If you're 99% sure, don't eat it. Only eat it if you're absolutely certain. It's best to have an expert confirm it for you. But back to the plant. This one is relatively easy to remove, but it spreads very easily. You can pull it from the grounds, but if you pull it while it has seeds, doing so will spread the seeds around the area. You need to pull every plant and then keep checking for new growth from the seeds. Another smaller plant is the Japanese stilt grass. You can really see this one spreading in our area. Pulling it by hand is effective if it's just a small amount, but this one spreads rapidly. Herbicides are more often used for larger amounts. Its seeds can stay in the ground for several years too, so it'll often return even if an area has been cleared. The seeds are also easily picked up and spread in the tread of your shoes or in the hooves of deer. So if you've been walking in an area with these plants, wash off your shoes before walking in an area clear of them. These are just a few of the invasive plants in the area. It's worth familiarizing yourself with more, especially if you have a yard where some of these plants could show up. DCNR, Pennsylvania's Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, has a website about invasive plants in our state that I'll link below. You can also find some PDFs there with lists of the plants and how big of a concern they are. So we've talked about invasive plants, but there are also invasive animals. Many of our invasive animals of concern are invertebrates. These include jumping earthworms and a number of insects, which includes one of our newest and biggest concerns right now, the spotted lanternfly. It was first spotted in southeastern Pennsylvania in 2014, but has recently made its way into our area. It feeds on a lot of plants, including important crops. It especially likes grapevines, maple trees, black walnut, birch, willow, and other trees. It has a very distinct look, and it's worth knowing what it looks like at different life stages so you can recognize it if you see it. The egg mass, seen here from the Pennsylvania State Extension Master Gardener's website, can be found from September through June on trees, rocks, vehicles, or other surfaces. If you see one, you should scrape it into a bottle of rubbing alcohol. The young lanternflies, or nymphs, look like this and can be found from late April through July, so keep your eye out. Slightly older nymph lanternflies look like this from July through September. Now here's the adult, which can be seen from July through December. And here's another view with open wings showing some bright red coloring. Tree traps and insecticide are mostly what are being used to control these life stages. You can also remove host plants like the tree of heaven, which is itself an invasive species. Finally, if you see any of these life stages, you're asked to report it to the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture so they can track the population size and movement of the spotted lanternfly. I'll put a link to the reporting website below. Now our main citizen science project this week is the Lost Ladybug Project. The species of ladybugs commonly found across the United States have been changing, with a lot of our native species becoming less common and invasive species being found more often. The Lost Ladybug Project is a way to track which types of ladybugs are found in which areas. To participate, you collect some ladybugs, take their pictures, and submit those pictures. The website gives you instructions in much more detail, as well as a lot of facts about ladybugs, identification resources, and more. It's worth checking out. You can submit observations right on the website or through the app. This is one the whole family can participate in together. Learning about invasive species and the efforts to control them might feel a little overwhelming or even discouraging. 
but it's good to be aware of our local species and which ones might be causing problems. You can do your part to help by removing the species you might have on your property, focusing on native plants when adding new plants to your yard or garden, or joining in an invasive tracking effort. Sometimes various nature groups will also have group volunteer days to remove invasive plants. Just like we talk about with all of our other topics, if we all make a little effort, it can really add up. Happy Nature Days!